Good day everyone. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit more about Berry's phase, which is the strange phase that appeared when we worked out the adiabatic approximation. And to begin, we're just going to do a slight reformulation of the problem. What we do is we let H depend on some physical parameters R. These are the physical parameters of the Hamiltonian. They could be the distance between atoms in a molecule, they could be spring constants, they could be the charge of a nucleus, the width of a well, whatever they are. And there are going to be n of these. So we'll write there's n of these, and we're just making an arbitrary vector about this. The units of these r's don't even have to be the same. But we have r1, r2, r3, and so on, up to rn, different parameters. And for any particular configuration R, so for any particular set of parameters, we can solve the Hamiltonian in principle. And so we can solve the Hamiltonian for any given set of parameters R, and we can make an orthonormal set of eigenstates. And now what we do is we're going to make all of those parameters of the Hamiltonian depend on time. So now that they're all, uh, all of our parameters are depending on time, we can invent a sort of a configuration space. And the configuration space for ours will look something like this. You've got, it's difficult if you've got more than three to visualize it, but you've got some arbitrarily sized parameters. Say you've got three parameters, say three widths of wells, or one of these could be, for example, a magnetic field strength. Another one could be the space between nuclei. Another one could be, I don't know, uh, the speed of light, which can change if we, if we let it. And within the configuration space, we will trace out a path. We start at some particular time t equals zero, and we make some path through this three-dimensional space whatever it looks like until we get to the end. At some final time, big T. And so this path is the vector R at T. And so now we see that our Hamiltonian is time dependent in the sense that it depends on a bunch of parameters which are varying in time. And we've already worked out the instantaneous eigenstates. Okay, so that's just a slight reformulation to remind us that the Hamiltonian will depend on some physical parameters, which in turn are depending on time. So let's write out our Berry phase as we did previously. remembering that these R's are vectors. And one thing that I said last time is that this quantity here is purely imaginary, which makes this phase purely real. So let's just go ahead and prove that now. And the proof is you take the time derivative of the Eigen instantaneous eigenvectors, and that's equal to because these are complex conjugates, I can write this as and since I've uh, normalized these instantaneous eigenvectors at all points in time, uh, this thing here is just one, and so the time derivative of this is just zero. But if I look at this, this term here is the complex conjugate of this term here. If I add some number and it's complex conjugate and I get zero, then they must be purely imaginary. And if that's purely imaginary, then the Berry's phase must be purely real. 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to make a transformation that will take us from time space into the path space or to the configuration space. So let's see how that works. Remember here I'm talking about the instantaneous eigenvector, which in the adiabatic limit is and is a real eigenvector because they kind of stick to it once they're in there. And remember that we have n of these parameters, whatever they are. How do we take the time derivative of such a function of many variables? We expand it out as follows. Make an expansion like this. That's just a chain rule. We can write that in sort of compact notation as a gradient in configuration space of our wave function psi n. Right, so that's our multi-dimensional dr1, ddr2, ddr3, ddr4, etc. And we dot that with dr by dt. What we've done is we have transferred the time dependence of the wave functions to a spatial dependence of the wave functions and a time dependence of the parameters of the wave function. And so we can rewrite Berry's phase as, so that one stays exactly the same. And so we end up with an integral in configuration space from some point r at zero to some other point r at t. But we need to be careful here about the limits of the integral because it's not just the limits of the integral that are important, it's also the actual path. So this is an actual integral around a particular path, the contour that we are specifically traversing. I, this one, not some other one that goes from the same start and end point, but goes through a different path. So this is a path dependent integral. The interesting thing though, is now time is gone. Providing that we're going slow enough, it no longer depends on how fast we're moving. All it depends on is the actual path that we take. So we've got our integral going through all the little steps of the path and we calculate this time independent quantity at all points r along the path and that's why we call this a geometric phase so generally this phase is not going to be observable uh, as we know, it's just an extra phase. But what Berry realized in the 80s was that actually if the path is closed, then the quantity becomes gauge invariant. And in that case, it can be measured. And it has been measured now in uh, different systems. So a few points about uh, Berry's phase. First is that Berry's phase is zero if the uh, instantaneous eigenvectors are real functions or if they can be chosen to be real. And we can prove that. We would have that the wave function and the derivative of the wave function with respect to time or with respect to space, either way, uh, would be real. But we said that it's purely imaginary, and so therefore it has to be equal to zero. All right, so we said that we proved that these uh, quantities have to be imaginary, so if the wave functions are real, then their derivatives are real, and therefore they must be zero. The second one is that Berry's phase vanishes if there's only one uh, parameter. Again, we can prove this without too much trouble. We will just write out that the phase is equal to, so now I'm writing all of the uh, spatial coordinates or spin space coordinates as X and our single parameter as R without the hat because there's only one of them. 
Now our grab becomes just DDR because again, there's only one of them. And I've uh, shown this already as a closed loop. So that integral here with the circle means that we're going around a closed path, a closed contour. In one dimension, uh, basically we're going to go along the path and come back again. Formally, we can show that we can take the integral, which is represented by uh, this quantity, and we're going to swap the integrals. And this second part here, which includes the path around R, is zero. And so the whole thing is zero. Finally, we can look at the 3D configuration space. So for example, if we have any three parameters, R1, R2, and R3, which is uh, similar to our usual three-dimensional space so we already have a bunch of mathematical tools that we can use to describe that and let's see what it gives us so we have a three-dimensional space as we did before r1 r2 r3 remember these do not need to be you know physically spaces like they don't need to be actual distances r1 r2 r3 they could be other quantities but we're still representing them as some configuration space, some 3D space. And we're going to have our path as before, except now we make sure it's closed. And around this path, we can write gamma is the integral of over that contour of some vector a dot dr where a is going to include the factor of i. So I'll write, I'll write that out in one second. Um, and now we can use Stokes's rule, Stokes' law, to go to So here a is the uh, Berry's connection for a particular uh, instantaneous eigenvalue n. And so using Stokes' law, we can actually turn this into a integral over the surface that's enclosed by the loop. And so uh, you take the curl of this connection over this surface here, and you will get uh, the connection. So this is very similar to, and you'll get the phase. So it's a very similar mathematics to what you get in electrodynamics. And the classic example for this is uh, what we'll do in tutorials, which is uh, rotating uh, magnetic field. So you've got some fixed magnetic field, but it's rotating in about some axis in some time dependent way. Okay, and so uh, I think that's a good place to leave it. We've just shown that the Berry's phase is a geometric phase, and we've learned a few things about when it might be zero. Thanks for listening.